So uh, welcome to uh, this conversation. In fact, um, Dennis, Mike and myself thought that uh, no one was going to turn up and we're going to go down to the bar and have the conversation. So instead, I'm really pleased that uh, we've got an audience. Um, my name's David Patterson and I'm Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Physiology. And about a year ago, just to set the framework as to why we're having this session uh, this evening, is that we published just over a year ago uh, in the journal uh, in a special issue which uh, was focused on the integration of evolutionary biology with physiological science. And we were really quite surprised in the reaction that we got uh, when we published this particular issue. So a lot of information came in to us over the web, over blogs, and we really felt for this audience at this meeting, we wanted to share some of the narrative that took place uh, because this is pretty controversial, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, and so the format, this, this is not a, a blue corner and a red corner with a debate. Uh, the, in, in, Ox, in Oxford, we call this a conversation. So. What we're going to do, uh, I'm going to fire a few questions uh, at my colleagues here, and uh, we're going to have this conversation. And then the plan is maybe halfway through, if we run out of steam, we're going to open it up to the audience and you can fire some conversation, fire some information at us. So we all know that physiology uh, it has really been the prince or princess of the biomedical sciences that underpins medicine and new discovery. Hence, the Nobel Prize is in physiology or medicine. But in the last 25 years, it's become evident that the subject area as a discipline has started to turn into a bit of a Cinderella subject, often being viewed as a phenotyping tool for the genomics and genetics communities. So we're going to discuss now with two leading uh, opinion leaders in the field. Uh, on my right, Dennis Noble, Emeritus Professor of Physiology at the University of Oxford and also current President of the IUPS. Dennis is a prolific writer uh, in this area. Uh, his uh, best-selling book, The Music of Life, has really set the scene for uh, the debate with the reductionists. On my left, in the blue corner is uh, <coughs> Michael Joyner, well known to this audience, uh, professor of anesthesiology at the Mayo, and also a prolific writer uh, and opinion leader in the field of uh, integrated physiology. So what we're really concerned about is a little bit of history. Why, why did the wheels come off physiology 25 years ago? Why has the mantra, molecule to man, essentially failed to deliver some of the big promises that uh, were talked about in terms of new medicines and cure for disease? And finally, why has the inconvenient truth of data often been ignored in influential circles, especially in the higher echelons of funding biomedical research, where today the world has taken a very gene centrism view of the evolution of disease. So this is the framework uh, of the conversation. And I'd just like to kick off um, maybe with you, Dennis, to start with, um, and ask a pretty simple question that is a probably got a very complex answer, but, you know, what, what is a gene? Well, let's be clear. I'm going to give a very simple answer, actually, David. Um, let's be clear, nobody knows. However, <laughs> let me <laughs> clarify that statement just a little, because I don't think you'll be satisfied with that. Um, it's defined today, of course, in terms of DNA, and nobody can doubt the importance uh, of the genome. Um, I think, though, it's been misdescribed. It's best described as a database used by organisms to enable them 
to generate the functions that you and I and others study as physiology. And what we have to remember in opposition to the gene-centric view is that in order for that to be the case, we inherit much more than our DNA. We inherit, number one, the whole of cell structure, which is self-templating. It doesn't need DNA to self-template. Many of you probably don't know, cells can actually divide without a nucleus. We inherit many forms of RNAs, which determine part of the way in which the genome is interpreted. We inherit many forms of epigenetic marking, and I don't need to tell this audience how big the field of epigenetics has now become. We also inherit behavioral marking of the genome. There are examples of all of these. Those are what we necessarily inherit in the short term, generation to generation to generation. In the longer term, even more fundamental changes are inherited in changes in the genome itself with various forms of genome reorganization in response to challenges from the environment. So I think the short answer, David, is we inherit much more than DNA. DNA is extremely important. Sequencing is very important too. But it's not the be-all and end-all of understanding function in physiological systems. You know, you know Dennis, and I, and I think to amplify that a little bit, the word gene didn't come about till around 1909 or 1910. And it, it has become an effort to reconcile heritability estimates from the population genetics people who, if your mother's this tall and your father's this tall, how much of the variance can we understand in the, in the offspring with molecular genetics. And so there's been about five or six distinct definition of what makes a gene since 1909. At one point, it was sort of a black box unit of phenotypic inheritance. Uh, that explain the correlation uh, between parent and offspring, for example. Uh, but as it's moved on, it's changed a number of times, uh, and we typically think of it now in terms of specific coding regions of DNA that code for a specific protein as sort of what you call that kind of a read-only yeah. version of it. But, but I think that's what needs to be challenged, and there's this mismatch between the way people think about population genetics and heritability and how the definition of gene has changed. This is, there's some terrific uh, papers about the history of the term gene uh, on PubMed, but I think this is largely forgotten and largely ignored. Yeah, I totally agree, Mark, and it's very, very important to understand that there's an extremely important conceptual difference here, because as Johansson introduced the definition right. in 1909, he referred to it as anything that determines the phenotype. Ein etwas, anything. Now, that is necessarily the cause of the phenotype because that's how it's defined. There's no question. You can't do an experiment to find out whether it is the cause. No experiment could demonstrate, given that it's a definition, that it's incorrect. By contrast, if you define gene as a strip of DNA, it's a very important empirical question for you and me and others to determine, does this particular bit of DNA actually affect the phenotype? Now, very interesting this, because if in, for example, yeast, you go through, as Hill and Mayer and his colleagues did in 2008, all 6,000 genes doing single knockouts of each of them, how many of them produce an effect? In normal physiological circumstances, only 20%. 80% are silent. Doesn't mean to say they're not functional. It means that the physiological processes that determine function, that represent function, are buffering those knockouts. So even if that particular gene or its protein was contributing a major amount of function, by virtue of the buffering in the physiological networks, you don't see it. And, and the complementary finding there, Dennis, is if you look at the genome-wide association studies for common diseases, at the, at the beginning of the Human Genome Project, that there was something called the common disease, common variant hypothesis. And the idea was for things like diabetes, heart disease, most cancers, you'd find a limited number of gene variants that would put people at three, four, five, six-fold risk for developing a given phenotype. And in fact, for almost everything that's been studied, hundreds of variants have been found. They have very, very small effect sizes, and the vast majority are less than 1.5. But let, let's maybe just yeah. know, pick this up a bit, you know, with the other side in terms of what they might say here. But 
you know, the gene phenotype linking disease has been a big push with, with funding in the last, last 20 years or so, but surely, undeniably, there are very strong genetic links to disease. If, you know, if you look at Huntington's disease, cystic right. fibrosis, breast cancer, cardiac arrhythmias, you can pinpoint down to the molecular level where this may have an impact on phenotype. So, and that's true in the sense of, of diseases with clear patterns of heritability many of which have been, were discovered with more primitive tools be, before uh, you know, easy sequencing and, and uh, kind of genomic centers. But what's interesting is that for things that used to be described as a single disease phenotype like cystic fibrosis, it turns out now there are far more than, than single snippets or single variants that account for it. One, the 508 mutation accounts for about 70, 80 percent. But 20 or 30 percent of cystic fibrosis is explained by other variants in the CFTR protein. And they're finding uh, that the penetrance is, is, is less than they had anticipated, not 100%. And also um, that the, um, the phenotype is highly variable. And a really interesting example is the issue of sudden death in young athletes. Initially, they thought they'd be able to find some fairly common things in the cardiac conduction system. But I think uh, they found about 2,000 private mutations that run in families that are responsible for this. And what's amazing is one individual in the family may die. The gene variant may be present, may be present in other family members who have absolutely normal EKGs, have no history of sudden death or arrhythmia. So even if one member of the family has the, the sort of tragic variant, having another member of the family with the same variant isn't necessarily a death sentence. So things have gotten even more complicated for simple diseases with clear patterns of inheritance versus these very complicated uh, things like heart disease, diabetes, most cancers. Could I try and clarify something here, David? Because yeah. I totally agree with what Mike has said, but I do want to make sure that we don't give the impression that anybody thinks that sequencing the genome was a mistake. Yeah, right. And I, I want to say something here that I don't think is particularly controversial, because even uh, Craig Venter and Collins have agreed with what I'm going to say. The outcome for healthcare has indeed been disappointingly small. They say that, not me. However, the outcome for fundamental biology, in particular for <coughs> understanding evolutionary biology, comparative genomics, and for reconstructing the trees, even identifying whole domains of life that we didn't formally think were separate, like the archaea that are different from the bacteria and different from the eukaryotes. All of that has depended on comparative genome sequencing. So this is not an anti-genome sequencing session by any means. What it is, I think, is saying two things. First of all, that as Mike says, the, the results, and as Venter and, and Collins also have said, admitted in a Nature article in 2010, the outcome for healthcare has been disappointingly small, and the need for physiological investigation to interpret it is therefore vastly greater than we ever thought. And that's why I would say that we now see physiology coming back onto centre stage, right. because the only way forward now is for physiology to come back as the prince. And the golden slipper has got to be found, David. <laughs> right. So, 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 David, historically, if you think about it too, Dennis, there were these things <coughs> called clinical research units or, or metabolic wards in hospitals where patients with unusual diseases, many of them frequently genetic, were studied in great detail with tremendous phenotyping. And those helped people really understand key metabolic pathways, um, uh, key patterns of inheritance, other things about physiological regulation and dysregulation. So. At some level, the older marriage of detailed mechanistic hypothesis-driven phenotyping with people with, with strange syndromes could go much, much farther now that they can be genotyped and, and products of the genes and, and, and you know, the metabolome and so forth can be added in, in, in complement to that. So, so we're at a position now where you know, billions of dollars have been spent uh, on this particular research train. That, that everyone is a part of or has been a part of. And it's quite clear that complex diseases, you know, it's been disappointing in terms of what we've got out at the other end. So, Dennis, if we could just maybe backtrack, uh, you know, how did we get to this point philosophically in terms 
of the, the cycle that we got into with funding? Well, I think it's very important to understand something that I think is widely misunderstood in terms of what the modern synthesis or the neo-Darwinist um, hypothesis Can is. Just, just maybe explain to the audience. You know, yes. Most people know about Darwin, but neo-Darwinism and the modern synthesis, these probably are unfamiliar terms Indeed to a lot so, of people. Indeed so, and I'm going so. to explain that. Yeah. That's right. Because Darwin's... Um, theory of evolution was actually a nuanced, multi-factorial mechanism. He specifically says in the introduction to the origin of species, I believe that natural selection has been a major contribution, but not the only contribution to evolution. Moreover, in the origin of species, he accepts Lamarckism. He accepts the inheritance of acquired characteristics. There are 12 places in the origin of species where that is spelt out explicitly. Moreover, he even produced a theory for how it happens. He postulated that there were particles, he called them gemules, that go down through the bloodstream because, of course, he realized that you have to then explain how it can possibly be that changes in the soma can have an effect on the germline. But that's precisely what genome marking is. So how, how he do we, was how, right. How do we get misled then? Now, we got misled by Weissman. August Weissman did an experiment in which he claimed that Lamarckism was impossible. He cut the tails of about six generations of mice. All the mice born to those animals had tails on them. Now, I want to say something very important here. That is not a test for Lamarckism. Lamarckism <laughs> is a test... For the, or testing Lamarckism would be a test for whether if you alter the environment, not a mutilation of an animal, you get a functionally important change in the inherited characteristics. So what you've got to do is to create an environment which taillessness is actually important, and he didn't do that, of course. But then he went even further. He made the assumption, it's an assumption, not a proof, that all the variations in the germline were random and small. And that's what led to neo-Darwinism, which is the, th the theory that accumulation of small random variations with time and together with natural selection can fully explain the evolutionary process. But there's no proof of that. There so, never has been a proof of that. So the neo-Darwinists got the causality the wrong way around. I'm afraid so, yes. The causality is the other way around. And Barbara McClintock understood that. She did the first experiments that showed that sections of DNA could... Well, she didn't call it DNA. She didn't know it was DNA. This is 1942. She showed in corn that sections of, gen, of DNA can move around from one chromosome to another. That's the beginning of mobile genetic elements. She was stopped from publishing. You asked why, as it were, we got into the mess we're in. We got into the mess because very powerful people actually exerted their influence to stop publication of important discoveries which we should not have ignored. Barbara McClinton was one of the first. 1953 onwards, she never published on that again because people didn't believe her. What happened? 30 years later, 1983, she got the Nobel Prize because by then, of course, people understood that mobile genetic elements were extremely important. She wrote in her Nobel Prize lecture, the genome is an organ of the cell. The cell, to talk about causality, is what tells the genome what to do. And that must be the case, because if I took the genome out of a cell and I put it in a Petri dish to get as many nutrients as you like, I could keep it for 10,000 years, it would do absolutely nothing. The genome on its own is nothing, the cell on its own is nothing, you need the two together. And it's the cell that tells the genome what to do. So I think the short answer, David, is we got the horse before the cart, or the cart before the horse, which that's the way round, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> cart in front of the horse. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, Mike, yes. Mike, Mike how, do we, how do we square all this? Well, thing? But, but, but I think just to, to, to kind of uh, add to Dennis's riff there, how many people here have heard of Francis Galton? A few. Francis Galton was Darwin's cousin, who was a, a polymath, independently wealthy, who attempted to mathematize Darwin and one is the, was one of the original epidemiologists or biometricians and started making very simple heritability uh, calculations. His students were Fisher and Pearson, so anybody who's ever suffered through a statistics class can blame Galton. And at, as Galton is doing this, uh, Mendel is rediscovered around 1900. 
And people, and then Johansson, as, as Dennis mentioned, in 1909 comes up with the idea of gene as this sort of black box mechanism that transmits phenotype. And things are racing along. People uh, come up with the idea that the chromosomes versus proteins are the genetic material and so forth. And how many people here know about Erwin Schrodinger, the famous physicist, Schrodinger's cat? So, and I didn't know this until I watched this incredible YouTube video of Dennis giving a talk in the Karolinska Institute where he points out that, that, that uh, Schrodinger was an Austrian, I believe. Or, yeah, or, Schrodinger was yeah. Austrian, yes. Yeah, and he right. was sitting out yeah. World War II in Dublin. He was a very interesting man. And he wrote a book, gave a series of lectures called What is Life? And he more or less predicted the existence of DNA as a crystal form. And while as, as we were talking about it at lunch, here's a man who really got into uncertainty and helped us understand scientific uncertainty, but he developed this idea that there was a read-only code. Exactly. Then more people got involved in that, Watson and Crick, and uh, come up with DNA. And then Crick comes up with something called the central dogma of molecular biology, which says that DNA is really DNA to protein is a read-only um, read one-way street. And they start using sort of uh, interesting terms, dogma, code, breaking the code, uh, blueprint of life, and so forth. And before you know it, you're, you're at a very hardcore position that genotype equals phenotype. Genotype equals phenotype. Now, the nice thing about that is that's very, very easy to sell to political leaders, to industry, to other people who fund research. Because if you break this code, then you can do something about it, fix it. I've called it biological orthopedic surgery. Gene is broken, find the, fix the broken gene, cure the patient. But that's really the narrative that's been sold. It's been really oversimplified, and it's also a narrative that is convenient for big science, moonshots, as opposed to the serendipity that has informed so much biomedical research. Can I add something yeah. about Schrodinger, Mike, if I may, yeah, with please. David's permission? You see, indeed, Schrodinger was absolutely right in predicting that the genetic material would be found to be what he called an aperiodic crystal, which, if you think about it, is a very good description of a polymer, if you think of a polymer as a crystal, which is aperiodic because it doesn't just go through a simple cycle. Now, that was his great success in What is Life, published in 1942, but then he made a absolutely catastrophic error. He said that physics and biology were quite different because physics is order at the level of thermodynamics from disorder, it's the bumping around of the molecules down here, but that biology was order from order. And you could see why he would think that was the case, and that's the basis of genetic determinism, of course, because since he thought it was a determinate readout and a read-only process, you're led to that conclusion. But there is no way, absolutely no way, in which biological systems can be immune from the stochasticity that occurs at a low level. What do you find when you take a population of cells, um, a cultured population, and you measure the expression levels of a particular protein? It doesn't matter which protein, because they all show this. You get a huge variation in the expression level between the different, ch different cells. It can be three orders of magnitude, depending on the particular protein. So at the bottom level, Schrodinger was absolutely wrong. There is stochasticity in biology. We all know that. And it's very important to take that into account because when you come to the question of whether the read-only view was or was not, not correct, only if you could have a determinate readout that was certain and secure could you be safe in having that kind of mechanism. If you've got stochasticity, you can't have that. But, but you're not saying that genes are not special? Genes are uh, special. They're special, okay, Dave, that's a very interesting question. They're special in the sense that they are a special database. They are not special in the sense that they solely determine the organism. I'll tell you one little story. In 2012, I was asked to debate exactly this at a congress of the, uh, it was a congress of systems biology applied to cells. I was asked to debate with Sidney Brenner, the great Nobel Prize winner for his superb work on C. elegans. And the motion I was asked to propose was that a ge uh, an organism is not defined by its genome. Sidney was asked to oppose that and he agreed. At dinner the evening before the debate, 
I said to him after we'd had some good discussion over a glass or two of wine, but Sydney, I can't understand why you're opposing me because everything you say is what I would say too. He leant over to me and he said, Dennis, I'm going to concede. <laughs> and <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and I had exactly the same experience with Dan Danette. Many of you here in the United States will know Dan Danette is one of the great philosophers of this country. You've got some very great philosophers too. But for some reason or another, he was trapped by the Dawkins view of the selfish gene. We were at a congress together. I gave a lecture the day before he gave a lecture. He was writing furiously notes while I was giving my lecture. The next morning he got up and said, I've changed my lecture. You know, what I think has happened is very interesting. The citadel that is neo-Darwinism is a house of cards. The reason there's nobody here to debate with us, David, is precisely that. Nobody has done, can do. There's been no answer to the J physiology issue. There's been no answer to what I said in the, in the Music of Life. A message has gone up there and nobody's replied. I don't think anybody's there. But the trouble is... <laughs> but look, there's a problem, and a problem for you and for me, because the great majority of our colleagues don't realise that the House of Cards has fallen. You talk to the funding agencies and you won't find the result you'd expect if people fully understood what we've just been saying. And, and then it becomes a need to sort of feed the beast. So you set up, you start doing big science. How many people know, here know who proposed the Human Genome Project? Do you think it was the NIH? It was the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy wanted to do the Human Genome Project because they wanted to find out about radiation effects from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They also wanted to patent the genes and do all sorts of other things. And they proposed this in the early 80s. The NIH got wind of it, and then there was, you know, the traditional kind of bureaucratic infighting about it. But their argument was that, that only the Department of Energy, because they had run the big physics lab and the accelerators and so forth and so on, that they had the skill sets to do this sort of big science. Uh, and, and if you look at from the very beginning of it, you have people like Leroy Hood saying in 1992 that in the next 25 years we will learn more about biology than we have in the previous 2000. Now the good news for Dr. Hood is he has two years left. Um, so, you know, if he has a strong finishing kick, he'll be okay. Um, but, and, and, and if you, and, and a lot of these individuals who are still around deny that they ever made genetic deterministic statements. But if you go back into the 1990s, it's clearly there. It's clearly there. Eric Lander, who runs uh, the Broad Institute, has said he never supported the common disease, common variant hypothesis. I can show you papers from the 1990s where he says that they anticipate finding a limited number of variants that evoke four to six percent, four to six fold increases in risk for common diseases. So now there's a bit of revisionist history going on as well, but these people made very, very hardcore uh, um, published predictions of, that really are genetic determinism where they said, well, yeah, there might be a bit of an environmental influence, but and you see a situation again where Dr. Collins, when he's been asked about this, has said his um, job is not to apologize for being an optimist. So that the 100,000 genome that the UK want to fund at the moment, waste of time? Or, or a million here. Well, it's interesting because uh, the Precision Medi Medicine Initiative is actually something that has been pitched uh, by the director of the NIH three or four times previously, and you can download slides of the 2004 version and the 2009 version and various versions of this. So, you know, who knows if it'll work, but... But, but in fairness to the other side, yeah. you know, if, if it's not, you know, 10 genomes or 100,000 genomes, what about the personalized genome? You know, is, is the variation right. within the person? That is, you need to personalize it for that genetic base, so if and you look then at, you get your medicine. So if you look at uh, prediction of diabetes, 62 pretty good risk genes for diabetes have been identified in GWAS. How many people think that a gene score gives you a better predictive test than waist circumference? <laughs> so the, the receiver operator curve for 62 genes is about 0.6. The receiver operator curve for waist circumference is 0.7. For waist circumference in three or four questions, it's about 0.8. For waist circumference three or four questions and a blood sugar, it's 0.9. 
which is about as good a clinical test as you can get. Now, the argument is for cancers, that they're going to uh, be able to do precision medicine and target the cancer therapy. Uh, the oncologists are wonderful people. I love them to death. They make a lot of business for us clinically in anesthesia. But they've also uh, learned to live on something called uh, progression-free survival or tumor responsiveness. They are very reluctant to publish survival data. Did this treatment improve survival? What is being found by, in, with many targeted, not all, there's been a few examples like Gleevec, but with many targeted therapies is they get a good initial response, but tumors are multi-clonal and adapt to the chemotherapy or the targeted therapy and come back later. So if you look at the trials of targeted therapy, you're talking about perhaps one or two months extension of life in many cases. It's going to be very difficult to design randomized clinical trials to prove it. There were efforts uh, 10, 20 years ago to target chemotherapy before they were targeted biologics. And uh, they were never brought to randomized clinical trials because they just couldn't figure out how to do it. So there is, is a lot of hope here, a lot of hype, but there are poorly defined metrics. There's this issue of uh, kind of whack-a-mole. You, you maybe make the tumor regress, but it comes back another way or in another form with a different clone. So I think that, that people should do this. I think it should be tried. But I think clear metrics for success should be defined. And I think they should be, uh, have to do uh, clinical trials that can kind of prove how this therapy might or might not work. I think it's something to add to that, if I may, David, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I think, a very positive message both for this audience and for the funding agencies. You see, the reason why what you've described, Mike, is what you might expect is that give or take a bit with maybe 25,000 defined genes in the human genome, the number of possible interactions, the number of possible circuits that you could form from 25,000 genes is 10 to the 70,000. There wouldn't be enough time over the whole billions of years of the evolution of life on Earth for nature to have explored more than a tiny fraction of those. So looking for the tiny fraction that actually exists is like looking for a needle in a haystack the size of the universe. So how do we do it? We do it as Jim Black did it when he discovered yeah. H2 receptors. We do it in the way that many other forms of drugs were discovered even before the sequencing of the human genome. You drill down from the level at which you do get understanding, which incidentally is physiology. Again, why physiology is back onto centre stage. We need the genomics, we need the data, yep. we need the young people in this audience, I've seen several of them that I know are doing excellent work on correlating genomics with right. physiology. We need all of that, but it has to be done with insight. That's exactly how Jim Black got his and, Nobel Prize. And I think you would point out that at the level of a bioassay, it, it, that, that that helps you resolve some of these initial signal to noise issues and helps you understand what to pursue versus to pursue Precisely something so. random. Yes. To, versus that. So I, I really think that's, that's a key point is to sort of find a bioassay or find a, a model system. And I think we talked about it again at lunch. Do we have any uh, uh, comparative physio are there any comparative physiologists left? And if they are, there are any of them here. Yeah, so there's a couple here. <laughs> One of the things we're suffering from is once you believe genotype equals phenotype, it's possible to make animal models where genotype does, in fact, make equal phenotype. And one of the problems that drug companies have had, for example, with something like Alzheimer's disease, is they've created a bunch of models that overexpress amyloid or tau. The animals get something that looks like Alzheimer's disease. They then create drugs that cure the disease in animals that fail in clinical trials because there's a whole prodrome of vascular and other things going on in Alzheimer's prior to the buildup of amyloid and, and tau and plaque. So the epidemiology tells you that vascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and so forth are important, but the animal models have now jumped to amyloid and tau. So I think we need to kind of go back to August Krogh 101 and start looking for the right animal models. There's been tremendous recent uh, uh, hits or successes looking at, at, at animals that hibernate to think about osteoporosis, for example. Uh, uh, um, the the, uh, the um, constrictor snakes uh, 
eating things and having cardiac remodeling as a result may provide clues that would help us remodel the heart and pathologic conditions. So I think the other thing we have to think about is how do we move beyond the um, uh, so much reliance on a limited number of animal models. Yeah, and indeed that requires also that we go back to wild populations. Right. Uh, let me tell you that one of the most important breaks with neo-Darwinism with the modern synthesis was by Conrad Waddington, who was the originator of epigenetics, incidentally. 1957, his book, uh, The Strategy of the Genes. Conrad Waddington demonstrated a way in which you could induce an, in an environmentally induced functional change in fruit flies. And you could only do that in a wild population. It would take too long to go through the genetic reasons for that, but the wild population was absolutely necessary. You do it in a cloned population, you can't do it. So even one of the most important mechanisms of evolutionary change, uh, determined by Waddington, who incidentally did the experiments that Weissman did not do, he did not cut tails off, he did a functionally important um, nudging, if you want to call it that, by the environment, looking for plasticity that was already in the population. That's where the animal physiologists will come in very, very useful to us. And we would not be able to do that if we just worked on cloned populations. So, so, so the, the parallel is a recent experiment, uh, or a series of experiments, on caloric restriction. Caloric restriction extends life in mice, correct? That's been tried in 60 strains of commonly used laboratory mice. About 20 uh, show no change in their lifespan, about 20 show an increase in lifespan, and about 20 show a decrease in lifespan. So it's really strain specific. It's also uh, dependent on the sex of the animal within each strain. So you get divergent responses, males versus females in the same strain. More importantly, if you go out and capture wild rice, or wild rice, wild mice, <laughs> shows you I spent too much time in Minnesota where we do get some wild rice. If you <laughs> capture m wild mice uh, and subject them to caloric restriction, they don't live as long. So again, we need to start thinking about animal diversity. The classic large animal models are, 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 are disappearing, and we've really kind of bet the farm on rodents. And, and you wonder uh, about a lot of things related to that, and if we should go back to sort of the August Krog, each problem's got, a, got an answer in nature if you can write, find the right model. So, you know, I think it's quite clear that, Dennis, you, you've had an impact on Sidney Brenner, for sure. And, and, and the, I'm and, damned in it. <laughs> and not yet Richard Dawkins. No, we'll, we'll come on to Richard that. in a moment. Um, <laughs> this is Oxford talk here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, certainly uh, Sidney, you know, has, when you read some of his statements, you know, in terms of the, what he probably calls the B-52 approach to <laughs> yeah. unloading to find the answer, which I think he was quoted as saying, well, all, all of this big genome stuff, uh, low input, high throughput, no output, uh, quote. <laughs> so, well, but he also invented exactly what I was talking about in the drilling down approach yeah. to find the needle in the haystack. He called it the middle out approach. That's in the Novartis Foundation Symposium on the Limits of Reductionism, published in 1998. Let's just touch on Richard Dawkins for a moment, because many people in this audience, of course, will be familiar with his book, um, The Selfish Gene, and having, ex having, having experienced the man firsthand as a student at Oxford, uh, although we didn't see him much because he's busy writing his books. But, you know, clearly, can a gene be selfish, Dennis? You can't attribute such a characteristic to a sequence of DNA. You know, when he first published The Selfish Gene in 1976, it was a famous philosopher, Sir Anthony Kenny, who put the obvious question to him. He said, Richard, you know, if all I knew as an English reader or speaker was just the letters of the English alphabet, I would not thereby be qualified to say that I could understand Shakespeare. He got the point. A sequence does not have meaning except in a context. Richard Dawkins' response was, well, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a scientist. I'm only interested in truth. That was 1976, the year of the publication of The Selfish Gene. I was chairing that debate. 
And that's when he lost me. Because what he clearly doesn't understand is that he has misused a metaphor. Now, I can prove that, because in 1982 he was challenged by the philosopher Mary Midgley, who wrote a criticism of the selfish gene. And she referred in passing to this metaphor, the selfish gene. Richard wrote back an article in philosophy in 1982, you can go and check it. That was no metaphor. And then he went on, provided that you define words in the way in which they are now used by biologists. Now what is a metaphor? A metaphor is precisely a change in the meaning of a word in order to apply the concept to a different target in your language. I'm afraid it's totally confused. He's a brilliant writer. The Selfish Gene is a fantastic read, so are a lot of his other books, but he is philosophically naive. And I'm afraid he's misled us, misled many people, for a very considerable period of time. If you want chapter and verse on that, it's in my little book, The Music of Life. Well, and, and Dennis, that's another thing. We, I talked earlier about how these sort of linear narratives are easy to sell to, quote, members of the establishment who build universities, who fund universities, who fund labs, who uh, elected officials, people in philanthropy, people sometimes in, in commercial interests interested in, in biomedical things. And that's another example of something that they could latch on to, could be explained to them in a very simple way because it, it as you pointed out, it, it's become um, widely adopted by behavioral econo economics oh, people, political economics, scientists. Economics, political science, yeah. law, sociology. Goodness me, the whole range, the whole gamut of the humanities and social sciences are bought into it. It's the, that uh, is the situation. The, the mixed metaphor. Yes. So, yes. so I think this would be a good time just looking at time because we're actually standing between you and your society aperitifs coming up <laughs> at 6.30. Um, but I think it would be very helpful, especially if any of the opposition is here, um, that we can uh, get some questions, uh, some Q&A going uh, between Dennis, Mike and, and yourself. So the microphone is there. Please uh, come up and identify yourself. and. Uh, let, let's have some questions. Thank you very much. Jai Paul Singh from Preston in UK. Um, we have spent a long time and a lot of money in understanding the human genome. And as you said, very little output out of this in, in terms of treatment. But what about some other diseases we have with lifestyle changes where more people die because of lifestyle, lifestyle changes, diabetes, heart disease, many other. Why don't we spend more time in trying to treat these, understand these more and treat these and prevent these, than all that money we spend on human genome. So, so you if, if you look at, you know, from 1850 to 1950, death from infectious disease, or 1940, fell about 90%. That was before the development of antibiotics and most vaccines. Uh, it, it fell due to public health measures. It fell to, due to changes in the built environment. And there's a whole collection of reasons that it fell. But they were all... Uh, primarily social policy and so forth. And it's, a, it's, it's much easier, to, I think, to sell people the idea that if we know your genome, the sort of biological orthopedic surgery I mentioned, it's much easier to sell that than it is to tell people you, you might have to uh, have a serious conversation about how car-friendly cities are. You might have to have a serious conversation about uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, that you might have to ha do for many things what we've done with tobacco control. So I think that those are very politically difficult things to do, but in places where the built environment has been changed, uh, those diseases are much less known. There's excellent examples, people that ride their bike to work in, in Amsterdam and, and Copenhagen live four or five years longer than their, their, their neighbors who drive. And, and you, know, you see people in most countries smoking cigarettes while they're riding their bikes. So they, 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 they may get lung cancer, but they're at least protected from the diabetes. So, so I think that, that you know, and you get into discussions about the nanny state and so forth and so on. But traditionally, public health measures have, uh, the return on investment has been huge in comparison to uh, dealing with diseases after they occur. Hi, I'm Fred Luft from Berlin. Uh, I'd like to ask the speakers for some personal advice. <laughs> 
Um, I was educated in medicine in the 1960s, and I thought I did personalized medicine because I would tell the individuals that had a huge waist circumference that maybe something could be done about it, and those that smoked, I asked them to stop. But my friends, uh, PhDs like um, Eric Lander or Detlef Ganten, who is an MD but doesn't have a license to practice medicine, now are coming up with precision medicine. And the cost of the genome has plummeted from 100 million bucks to 1,000. Right. Cheaper than getting an MRI scan or a colonoscopy. And I'm certain that even within my lifetime, all people at birth, instead of having a Guthrie test, will get their genome sequenced irrespective of the advice that you give. Now, what are practicing physicians supposed to do with this information? Well, well and Fred, that's really the problem is, so you tell somebody that they have a one point, their, their relative risk of developing disease X is, is 1.2. So you could say, well, wow, you have a 20% increased risk of having this disease. On the other hand, if it's a very rare disease, uh, you know, only a very limited number of people may get it. So how you turn this information into clinical decision-making tools is almost impossible. And that's one of the main problems. And so if you actually look at it, uh, using these larger phenotypic tests are essentially are the clinician's um, equivalent of a bioassay because they tell you so much more in terms of risk prediction. But the expectations are going to be massive because of the propaganda that's right. made. And our attorney friends are going to be listening to this. Well, and so if you, if you look at it exactly, so there's a couple of interesting things there. The studies that have been done so far show that most people don't understand the, these risk ideas, risk estimates. People frequently who are told they're at increased risk become cavalier and think there's nothing they can do about it. People who think that they're at reduced risk think, become cavalier and think, well, I'm protected, you know, so I can go and do whatever I want. And there's some evidence from statin data. People are put on statins and think they're vaccinated against heart disease and they gain weight and their behavior gets worse. And if you look at the, if you look at the people who, who get their genes sequenced by, by commercial organizations, you know, mail order genome testing, there is some evidence that those individuals start demanding biopsies. They start demanding more and more follow-up. And there's an iatrogenic cost to all of this. So, so until people have a serious conversation about how you interpret this data, turn it into clinical decision-making tools, and make sure that it isn't just a license for the medical industrial complex to do more scans, more biopsies, more exploratory surgery, and so forth and so on, you're not ahead. So I, 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 I agree with you, and, and that's why I've been trying to promote a more sober discussion of some of these things. Yes, please. Uh, Raj Varigyapalli from Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, it, it's a very fascinating discussion, and one thing I wanted to uh, bring up for uh, your comments, as well as others might be in the audience, is uh, there might be a $1,000 genome, but there's actually a $100 bracelet, Fitbit, or whatever it is that you wear that collects physiological <laughs> data of a whole battery of things. So there is an opportunity here that's much more personalized than the $1,000 genome in ways that brings back the conversation and the ability to influence in a completely different direction, if you will. And is that something that we ought to be talking about and incorporating in the way we do research and not just it's a population thing, you know? Yeah, there are new tools that would, will permit people to phenotype large numbers of individuals. How accurate that is, how reliable it is, so forth and so on. There's been some papers in JAMA on those topics. But, but there, there is some potential there. But, you know, most people uh, buy their monitors, use their monitors for a while, and only a limited number really are enthusiasts for it. But could we add something Please. here, if we may, Mike, which I think is very relevant to this very good question. When I had a, a conversation like this with the Chief Scientific Officer of 23andMe, yeah. which is, of course, one of the major genome sequencing companies, she admitted you needed precisely what you're saying. That is, you've got to add the phenotypic characteristics measured carefully to the genome characteristics before you can do anything. That's the first point. So I think the genome sequencing people, possibly 
uh, I mean the industries right. involved, possibly led by the FDA, which of course has been very, very concerned about precisely this question. There's some very big ethical issues here, which I'll come to in just a moment. They actually now recognize that you'd need to have both. Right. That's the first point. Now the second thing to say is there are no good and bad genes. There are genes that are used. Now, remember cystic fibrosis. Yeah. Remember the, uh, the, the, the sickle cell anemia too. Usually, through the evolutionary process, because remember, this is supposed to be a conversation about evolution as well, <laughs> there are reasons why those genes are there. And they have to be positive reasons for them ha to have been selected. So, I'd like to get the message across that this is going to be ethically quite difficult. Some of those genes that we identify, the alleles of course, those genes, variants of those genes, as being risk factors, may or may not be overall risk factors until you know what else they do. And where do you get that information from? Again, you get it from physiology drilling down to find out function. That's again why we are necessary. P people who are heterozygote for cystic fibrosis, the idea is might have been protected against cholera many, many years ago. Indeed, yeah. And, yeah. and, and with the um, sickle cell trait, not, sickle cell carriers may be protected from malaria. Exactly. There's a yeah. number of examples of things like that. Um, ideas about salt retention uh, being helpful in, 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 in hot, humid environments for survival. And, and keeping our blood pressure up and keeping our blood volume up, but then you put people in a, in a uh, low physical activity, salt uh, f filled world, and they become hypertensive. I mean, those are, that's, those are oversimplifications, but, but, but th those are some of the ideas that are out there. Is there a question at the back? Uh, John Horn from the University of Pittsburgh. First of all, I want to say this is wonderful. Uh, I think a big problem we're having here, I think we're all in agreement, so we're sort of preaching to the choir. Uh, and, and one of the problems in listening to this is, is yeah. that uh, there's a big difference between the scientific opportunity that genomics presents and, and our opportunity to translate that into better public health. And, and I think in some ways what's happening in this country is a repeat of what happened during the doubling of the NIH budget 15 years ago where essentially, uh, and we were guilty of this to some extent, that we oversold it to the government and, and to the public, what, what the doubling of the budget would deliver, and at the same time, now, what genomics will deliver. Uh, I think it will eventually deliver, but instead of happening in a framework of 10 years, we might be looking at something that's 50 or 100 years away, and there'll be many surprises. And, and but the problem we have is really a political problem in the sense that the train has left the station. The President of the United States has already endorsed personalized medicine. Uh, many of our home institutions are busy constructing <laughs> genomic personalized medicine institutes as fast as they can. Our deans are funneling money into it as fast as they can. And, and everybody wants to make this happen at their place. So I think the challenge for physiology is to figure out how we can constructively moderate and modulate that discussion so that it doesn't turn into an even larger political disaster. Well, could I say something about that, uh, um, Davis? I've had considerable uh, experience of advising government committees and um, research agencies, certainly in the United Kingdom. And I think you're putting your finger on a very major difficulty. Of course, the great majority of the people we're talking to were educated in biology 30 or 40 years ago. And they really have no idea of the sea change that's occurred. And that's why I was referring earlier on to the fact that the House of Cards, the Citadel if you like, is empty. Um, but many people still don't know that. Now, I think you're absolutely right. Whatever we do, we must not make undeliverable promises. And I have a big worry here. Because there are many amongst our colleagues, uh, even outside the community of physiology, who have thought that, well, the answer to why things went wrong, or went wrong in relation to healthcare anyway, 
not in relation to use for fundamental biology. As I said earlier on, the comparative genomics has been extremely valuable. But what they would say went wrong with um, genomics in relation to healthcare can be solved. And it can be solved by a field called systems biology. Now, I always ask myself the question, when that became um, popular from about the year 2000, why invent a new word? Actually, it's Sidney Brenner's view, too. You've got a word for this already. It's physiology. <laughs> you know. So we don't, in a sense, need... Well, but we all nevertheless understand the politics here. It is that, of course, many of those who come into the area of realising that a systems approach is needed are not themselves classically physiologists. And I welcome that. That's, that's absolutely great. But I think we're arguing here for hearts and minds because it's quite a small proportion of systems biology that is actually understanding the role and the significance of physiology. Maybe some, maybe some, maybe some of our well, opponents are. It's okay, I continue even if the gods do whatever. <laughs> so so, uh, so uh, uh, let me just, let, let, me, let me add one more thing if I could, uh, Dennis and David. I, I think I would encourage everybody to go and read Comro and Drips. Oh, yes, this retrospectroscope. Yeah, and there's a yes. shorter version of it about the discoveries required to do open heart surgery. It's in circulation research in about 74 or 75. And it's much easier to sell these linear stories to the agencies, to the funders. We're going to make a lot of progress if we double the NIH budget, if we have a war on cancer. There's a quote in there from Lyndon Johnson about we must not let cures be locked up in the laboratory from 1966. You can look at these quotes of Lyndon Johnson in, 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 in uh, the Comro and Drips paper. Change a few words and you could just have Barack Obama be saying them right now. So it's really, really instructive. And I think one of the things, again, that's hard to explain to people is how we need to make kind of, Yogi said we made the wrong mistakes. That's why we lost the baseball game. We have to make the right mistakes. Nitric oxide was a mistake. Viagra is a mistake. VEGF inhibitors were going to cure cancer. They're great for macular degeneration. They don't do much for cancer. Remicade, terrific for arthritis. It doesn't do much uh, for sepsis, what it, was, what it was created for. So trying to help people understand the serendipity, the things that might come 50 or 100 years from now, you know, uh, these people won't be running for office then. So given that we've run out of tokens in the light meter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The tennis courts. Yeah, and but I think have we really got back to sort of my introduction about the prince and the princess, the, the Cinderella subject. Uh, in fact, physiology really does need to reclaim uh, that slipper. And hopefully uh, this conversation has, has given you a bit of firepower to think about uh, what has been said. Uh, I'm very grateful and on your behalf would like to thank Mike and uh, Dennis, and at the end of the uh, hall, there are complimentary copies of the special issue uh, on physiology and evolutionary biology. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah.